Kathy Whitmarsh, who I've seen three times this week. You all know the drill. We wait a couple of minutes to before we begin. So hello and welcome to you all before our official start. It's lovely to see so many people who've been at all of our blue stocking events this week. Joe Faulkner, hello. <laughs> Kathy Rittmeister. Kathy Rittmeister has been very good and come to all three events and gone off to Macquarie and organised her own one. Nadia, hello. <laughs> Marianne. This is the bad bit when I start saying hello to people I like to say hello to and then I don't get to say hello to everyone and look terribly rude. So <laughs> hello to everyone. Hi, Henry. <laughs> So Faulkner's got new hair. This is the bit where I should be quiet. <laughs> we'll just give everyone a couple more minutes. So hopefully you've all got to come along, some of you at least, to a couple of our Blue Stocking a Week events this week. They've been absolutely fabulous. It's been really lovely to see so many of you but it's also really lovely to see so many of our members actively engaging with issues that confront women across our sector. So it's been a really exciting week for the NTU. I'll almost be happy that it's over after this afternoon because I'm a tiny bit nervous, but I'm very excited. <laughs> oh, there's a Rittmeister grandchild. That's lovely. <laughs> just, she just turned one on Wednesday. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> It's nice to see babies and dogs and, you know. Cats bums, a lot of cats bums on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> COVID has exposed us to many new things. <laughs> All right, everybody, we've got about one more minute to go. Oh, somebody's gone to a, a blue stocking uh, feminist trivia night. Fantastic. They are always fun. We've had a few of those across the country. They're always good events. One more minute and we'll begin. Uh, packing. Uh, Cecile is packing a room as they're watching on a big screen. That's exciting. We're on the big screen. I like these bits where I can see. Oh, Charlene is happy with how the trivia went. I saw photos that she tweeted this morning and put on Facebook. The Queensland Division event looked fantastic. Congratulations to everybody who went to that. Oh, there's Curtin. Oh, this is true. Curtin Branch is joining in. Hello, everyone in Western Australia. Welcome to the entire Curtin Branch, which is, I think, having lunch, and we're boomed in on their big screen. That's fabulous. So we have people from everywhere doing fantastic things. Oh, that's great. All right, everybody, enough chit chat, enough silly chit chat from me, and I think time to begin in earnest. As I said, welcome everybody to our final event of Blue Stocking Week. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on traditional Aboriginal lands across the country and pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. Welcome to the final event of our Blue Stocking Week, the NTU Annual Lecture, which, as I said, concludes our activities for this week. Blue Stocking Week Take Action for Equity is an initiative of the Women's Action Committee and proudly supported by the NTU Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Policy Committee and the NTU Queer Unionists in Tertiary Education. The theme for 2021 Blue Stocking Week is Take Action for Equity. It draws upon the feminist roots of Blue Stocking Week. And while we celebrate the achievements of women in education, we're also acknowledging that we need to continue the fight for equity. NTU survey data tells us that one in five people across our sector have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace. Blue Stocking Week is a call to our university community to stop this kind of action and to take action for equity, to organise around equity, whether that be via building delegate networks, highlighting a particular issue through events and organising activities, or through support for local bargaining claims and viewing those through an equity lens. 
Today, we're going to be joined by Kate Jenkins, Sex Discrimination Commissioner and member of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Her purpose is to advance gender equality consistent with the Sex Discrimination Act and the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. This session's equity theme is to discuss sexual harassment and gender-based discrimination. Kate will reflect on the findings of the Respect at Work National Inquiry into Sexual Harassment in Australian Workplaces report of 2020, and more specifically, as sexual harassment is experienced by staff and students in universities. After Kate's presentation, you'll have the opportunity to ask Kate questions. The NTU's Director of Policy and Research, Terry McDonald, will also be available if you have a question that is specific to the NTU. I'll ask you to keep your questions as short and to the point as possible so we can allow as many people to speak. As this is a very big group, we're going to mute all microphones while Kate is speaking to ensure she can be heard. During the Q&A, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the raise hand function and I'll put you on the speaking list. Welcome everybody, and I'd now like to pass to Kate Jenkins. Thank you very much, Alison. A real, a real clap on Zoom instead of one of those picture claps. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I uh, say hello to everyone across the country. I'm speaking to you from Boonarong land for the people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And so great to see you all and all the different environments that everyone's sitting in. It's nice to be able to see some faces, even if I couldn't be in the room with you. Um, so just starting, I'll start by acknowledging the long term and really informed and thoughtful advocacy that the NTEU has had on the issues of sexism, sexual harassment and sexual assault on university campuses. That has been my experience for the entire time. I've been sex discrimination commissioner. Uh, when I started in 2016, the first uh, thing, the first project I worked on seriously was the project that looked at the national survey of sexual harassment and sexual assaults of students in universities. And even right back then, you contacted me and said, it's not just students that you should be considering. And in lots of ways, the Respect at Work report that I will also cover today is the worker perspective or the worker view of the issues that were covered in Change the Course. Uh, so there is no question that this is an incredibly important topic for this audience and for tertiary education institutions, both uh, looking at universities as an industry or as a workplace for all the workers and students in it, and also as a location for primary prevention. So I am now going to do what we've all learned how to do is share my screen with you and um, I'll just do a quick check that I'm, Celeste, I can see your face. Thumbs up if you can see, I can't see it yet. So let's wait a minute. I know why, because I've probably run to the end. Let's just don't look at this in reverse. <laughs> um, you've just got a little pre preview so you can see that Celeste cool um, okay so I'm going to start with the really kind of boring straight down the line topic the def definition of sex discrimination of sexual harassment which is in the sex discrimination act just a quick refresher um, and one of the things that Respect at Work really told me is that while people in theory know what sexual harassment is in practice, actually did not have a really good understanding. So put really simply, sexual harassment is unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature where it's reasonable the person receiving the conduct would be offended, humiliated and intimidated. Now, that act covers a number of areas of public life. One of them is in education and the other is in employment. And so to some degree, I'm going to cover both Change the Course and, um, and Respect at Work. Change the Course was for students in education and Respect at Work was about the workplace or employment side. 
So if I just start with just a quick overview of Change the Course, because I feel like in the time that I've been in this role, I have looked at the issue particularly of sexual harassment and sexual assault in universities from a couple of different angles. Uh, many of you will know that this uh, national survey of more than 30,000 students across the 39 universities came about uh, due to the long-term, uh, really consistent advocacy of students, of uh, unions, and of particularly of the women's sector. And you might recall uh, that in uh, around the time of 2016, the movie The, the Hunting Ground came to Australia, which uh, also prompted a very active conversation about the experience of sexual assault of students in universities. And uh, as a natural progression, almost I would say in 2021, we're having a conversation as well about the experience of sexual harassment and sexual assault in schools that particularly has been um, turbocharged with the with the petition started by Chanel Contos that has um, started a real or continued a real conversation about consent and education at schools. Uh, and that is quite topical now. And of course, Grace Tame has really continued that conversation as Australia of the Year. Uh, so there was global attention. We conducted this survey in 2016. It was a national survey on the prevalence, nature and reporting of sexual harassment and sexual assault in the 39 Australian universities. Uh, as well as the survey, we also received almost 2,000 submissions on this topic. And I will note that that still continues to be the most submissions we've received on any project we've conducted at the Human Rights Commission. Now, I won't go through, this is a list. I will come back to that list of the recommendations we made just to give you a sense of the findings that came out of that report that some of you will be aware of. Uh, firstly, we found one in five students were sexually harassed in university in 2016 and 1.6% of students were sexually assaulted in university settings in 2015 and 2016. I realise to this audience, I'm giving you the student statistics, but as an underpinning and the conversation at the time by the union and more broadly was there, there are also um, education providers, teachers who are experiencing these same experiences. Women were almost twice as likely as men to have been sexually harassed in a university setting and more than three times as likely as men to have been sexually assaulted in a university setting in that period. Um, and students who were bisexual, gay, lesbian and homosexual also reported higher rates of harassment and assault than those who identified as heterosexual. We noted that a large number of the students who were sexually harassed and sexually assaulted in that period said the perpetrator was a fellow student. I'm getting a bit behind with my um, statistics. And additionally, only 94% of students, sorry, 94% of students who were sexually harassed and 87% who were sexually assaulted did not make a formal report to the university. So we made a number of recommendations with those results. Um, they were fell into five areas. So the first was that university leaders needed to make a stronger and visible commitment to action, engage more effectively with students and implement recommendations clearly and transparently. The second, was that universities undertake targeted education and campaigns aimed at changing attitudes and behaviours. Thirdly, was that universities improve their responses to sexual assault and sexual harassment, including ensuring that students have access to specialist support. Fourth, we recommended monitoring and evaluation of measures taken to ensure they're evidence-based and improvements are made over time. And fifth, in relation to residential colleges, which wasn't the specific focus of the review, we recommended that independent expert-led reviews be uh, conducted to identify measures to address the high prevalence rates of sexual assault and sexual harassment in that settings. The results were um, significant. Um, you will might recall that all 39 universities agreed to publish their results at the time. 
Uh, they all accepted the majority of the recommend the nine recommendations we made, and actually the majority of them accepted all of those recommendations. So you will, just to bring you up to date, and I know that you've all been notified through the union anyway, that in, two, in this year, there is currently, um, the survey is being continued. It was scheduled for last year, but got delayed because of COVID. Uh, so when we get the results uh, to that survey, it will be five years since the previous survey occurs, and that will come out next year. It is... Um, it will be significant to learn what the progress has been from since that time. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. So now I'm just going to jump you straight to the National Inquiry, which was uh, something that happened after that. And uh, you, many of you will know the uh, National Union, the union um, made a significant and important submission to the inquiry and also conducted your own survey of the members to determine what was the experience, particularly of sexual harassment of uh, workers who are members of the National Tertiary Education Union. Um, the, the National Inquiry happened in the context of an ongoing conversation. To some degree, the Change the Course survey that we conducted was a precursor and came out in August. And October 2017 was the date that the Harvey Weinstein story hit the news and started a global conversation. One of the important things that I will circle back to is the importance of action on these uh, important issues of sexism, sexual harassment and sexual assault, focusing on industry action. So to in a, in a really positive way, the university sector, whether, whether it embraced it or not, had started engaging in the issue of sexual harassment and sexual assault on university campuses uh, because of a global conversation about that topic uh, that predated the Weinstein incidents. Uh, but it has been a really good example of how important national and collective action on an issue is to getting movement. And I will come back to that discussion. So the National Inquiry was something that was launched in 2018 off the back of the Global Me Too conversation, which existed in Australia as well. Um, and it was announced and supported by Kelly O'Dwyer, who at that point in time was the Minister for Women. It was an 18 month inquiry and coincided with our fourth national survey on sexual harassment, where 10,000 people were surveyed. And for the first time we received industry data to give us more information about the experience. We, I conducted 60 public consultations across the country, attended by 600 people, including members of the union. Thank you. Uh, we received 460 submissions. There was economic modelling conducted and we undertook global research. And the re report was launched on the 6th of March, 2020, with the, the then and now uh, Minister for Women, the Honourable Maurice Payne. It was tabled in Parliament on the 5th of March, 2020, which many of you will recall uh, was the last day, last sitting day before all of Parliament's attention turned to the COVID pandemic. Um, just to jump forward to now, this is probably a good time to give you a bit of an overview before I go through the findings, is that the government announced their response to the inquiry on 8th of April this year uh, with the attorney, Michaelia Cash. And the response was that um, all of the 55 recommendations were accepted in whole, in part, in principle or noted. And that is their language. But what that means in practice is the noted ones were primarily the ones that weren't for government. And at, by and large, all of the other recommendations have been actioned in some way since that time or are in train. And I'll come to what that looks like in practice. Part of the reason for that uh, quite ultimately quite strong response by the government was the sequence of, of events uh, from when our report was launched 
to that announcement date, which included a number of uh, quite significant sexual harassment issues reaching our media reporting and causing really an ongoing recognition that this problem existed in many of our industries. So you might recall in June of last year, there was an, a statement by the um, Chief Justice of the High Court on sexual harassment by one of the now retired High Court judges. Later in the year, you will know better than I that there was an ICAC investigation in Adelaide into the University of Adelaide Vice-Chancellor, which um, has caused a conversation about that same person's previous work experience in two other universities. AMP drew attention when they promoted someone who'd been found to have engaged in sexual harassment and particularly not only customers, but in particular investors questioned the rigour and the action by AMP. Jump forward to this year, I've already mentioned Chanel Contos's petition on sexual assault of schoolgirls, Grace Tame being appointed as Australian in the year of the year, and then Brittany Higgins disclosing her experience of sexual uh, alleged sexual assault in Parliament. So with all of those issues, uh, which I, I suspect will not su surprise anyone here, it just continued to highlight that Australia continues to face a challenge with gender inequality and violence against women, and particularly in the workplace. But I guess if you're a glass half full sort of person, you'll realise that uh, fortunately, we're in a position where an 18-month national inquiry had been conducted on exactly this topic and recommendations had been made as to what needed to happen to change. So if I just give you a quick overview of the findings, because um, I will give an overview of the findings and recommendations, uh, but I'm looking forward to also taking questions as we go. So I encourage you to follow Alison's suggestions to um, Think, think up your questions as we go. Um, so the first was that we found that sexual harassment is a common experience. One in three Australian workers had experienced sexual harassment in the last five years in 2018, which was up from one in five in 2012. Again, if you're interested, we are conducting the next, which will be the Commission's fifth national survey survey next year. We are currently um, commencing preparations for that. That was one of the recommendations of the Respect at Work report, and it will be very interesting to see the results in 2022, although I think the changes that are currently being implemented will probably not have converted into real life action, although I would hope they would. Um, that finding, I'll come back to the industry findings, actually. Second, we found that the current system had placed the onus on the victims to complain, and yet only one in five people had who had experienced sexual harassment had complained. So as uh, particularly in your sector, you would know that it is high risk to complain. There is a range of things, and in particular, the survey that your union conducted, which was of something like over 1,350 people, just listed all the reasons why people were reluctant to complain, not just because they didn't know that they would believe, but concerned that there would be no action, uh, that uh, they would suffer negative consequences. And your survey found that actually 60% of people who did complain were unhappy with the process and the results. So we're not a country that likes to complain, but also given that sexual harassment is driven by power and power disparities, if the person is complaining is on limited tenure, doesn't have um, ongoing work, is more junior, it is not surprising that it uh, they are reluctant to complain. So our system that relies entirely and at the moment under the Sex Discrimination Act of only really been enforced if someone brings forward a complaint, it's unsurprising that that has not been effective, even though it was well intended. The next finding was we found that sexual harassment happens in all workplaces. 
So we had for the first time we received industry specific data using the large 21 ABS industry sectors, the one that's most relevant to you but would include um, also secondary and primary education is the education and training sector which came out at 39%. It found that 46% of men in that sector had been sexually harassed in the last five year, years and 35% of women. So what that tells you is it is actually above the industry average, which was 33% at 39%. And it's significantly higher for men, although we didn't get the breakdown. And I know your survey results didn't show that gender breakdown. It showed it in reverse. And I think that will potentially be given that the secondary and the primary education sectors are largely female dominated. And finally, we found that sexual harassment has a high cost. The annual cost of sexual harassment at that time, modelled by Deloitte Access Economics, was found to be $3.8 billion. Majority of that was worn by the employer. So the recommendations that we made were about shifting the model from a, a situation which is primarily responsive and depends on the courage and bravery of victims. And those recommendations fell into five areas. Firstly, data and research. So I've already talked to you about the value of having that information where we can track not only what's happening now, at what age and what sort of experiences by industry, but also be able to look at it in the past and project into the future. Second was primary prevention. And this is a place where there are some specific recommendations that directly link back to change the course. So we did find that uh, primary, secondary and tertiary education, as you would know, are such an important strategic uh, moment for an intervention for primary prevention on sexual harassment. So the finding was that the key driver of sexual harassment was power disparities. And in most of our workplaces, the, the, most, um, the most prominent power disparity that continues to exist is gender inequality. So the primary prevention work of organisations like Our Watch that looks at intervening in particular settings like education and like sport are really important for changing those drivers to promote gender equality. So we did make recommendations about education on gender equality, on sexual harassment and broadly on workplace rights for schools and also in tertiary sectors and not having forgotten the NTEU's good advocacy way back in Change the Course, recognise that that education for both students and for educators in universities was very important for the broader reach and impact than you have. Uh, so I do recall um, that from respect at work, if you look at the student population in at universities, and then you look at the uh, highest age bracket in sexual harassment, the highest age bracket was the 18 to 29 years of age, young people. And when I did some consultations, particularly with young university students, they were invariably um, had, had had multiple casual work engagements in the retail and hospitality sector, um, often in small business, but definitely in places where they were regularly in the least powerful position, but heavily dependent on that income to get them through their university. We made recommendations about a new legal and reg regulatory framework. I'm happy to talk to you more about that as well. Uh, but the gist is we found that uh, there is an important intersection between the fair work, the safety and the human rights framework. Uh, and you will have seen if you're following anything that there has been a big move of safety regulators to start putting their focus to psychosocial um, injury, and that includes sexual harassment. Our finding was that the safety legislation already applies to sexual harassment, 
but workplaces weren't viewing it that way and in practice regulators weren't enforcing it. So there has been good activity. Safe Work Australia has provided resource. Comcare has done some good education. The one thing I would say is this doesn't mean that it's safety now and it's not a human rights issue. The Sex Discrimination Act still does continue to apply and some of you will have known my advocacy for a positive duty in that act because you're leaving the primary legislation that prohibits sexual harassment without any positive duty on employers, and that is undermining the system of prevention. The third area that I'll come to just briefly is the workplace prevention and response framework, and finally, better support advice and advocacy. I'll just quickly go, I've spoken to this issue about the importance of uh, universities and tertiary education institutions for primary prevention. I will just show this and let you ask questions. So the last thing I just wanted to get to was really to talk about um, what we've written in the inquiry about what prevention of sexual harassment looks like. So what we found was universities included, everyone had with great um, intention, good intentions, um, been putting in place policies and training and complaints procedures on the idea that that was uh, their obligation to avoid liability on sexual harassment. While they might have been doing that to avoid liability, it was it has been ineffective in preventing sexual harassment, as those statistics have told you, including the recent increase. So the domains which are in the report, and if you're interested, the community I'm guide I'm is a really I'm easy. Yeah. Quick one. Someone's got themselves off mute back. Back on mute. Well done. Thank you. So just to give you a sense, it was looking at organisations, really looking at things about their leadership, their culture, taking a better safety approach in terms of risk assessment and measuring and sharing details of what they were doing to make sure they were targeting the particular risks. Uh, looking at knowledge more broadly, and this is a sector that knows knowledge very well, rather than one training session every two years, surprisingly, doesn't uh, have a significant impact. You could probably tell me. Um, I've certainly learned uh, spiral education and different ways to learn uh, supports and reporting as well. So all of those are a mix of improving the prevention focus and also strengthening the response to ensure that they are responses that are useful. There's multiple options and they don't cause further harm. One of the things just in closing, and this might go to some of the questions, is that in the report, we in particular, we, we did look at how some individuals have higher risks of sexual harassment. I mentioned that in relation to the students, but that's also in, in relation to employers, so LGBTI communities, people with disabilities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island communities and migrant workers all were at a higher risk, more around the rates of one in two workers in the last five years had been sexually harassed. Uh, but we also identified that when you started taking an industry approach, you can identify the systemic risk factors that actually apply across a whole industry. I've really strongly advocated and one of the recommendations is to encourage for industry action and to some degree the Respect Now Always initiative has tried to lead on that uh, and consistently in that work has been engaging with union students as well as other organisations on a university or in a university business model. Uh, there's a couple of things that we observed. One is, and, and another industry where this was highly discussed, uh, was the media and entertainment industry. The reality is if you've got people who are in temporary or not long-term tenured roles that rely on word of mouth, where you've got hierarchical education sort of mentoring structures with heavy dependence on more senior people um, for advancement, when you've got events that involve outside of normal work hours, including social events, uh, that, that can be a higher risk. So we did have a section where we talked about hierarchical organisations like law, medicine, academia, as, uh, as places with particular traits and, where, and that are often highly sought after roles. 
So we know that they create higher risks. So notwithstanding that these are educated um, populations, that is not uh, the answer to solving the once every two year education function and telling people that they really should uh, make a complaint is not prevention. Uh, and we uh, are, I think, in real time seeing some changes. So I'm going to stop my sharing and, Alison, I'll pass to you to um, facilitate any questions. Before we begin the questions, if you could all join me in thanking Kate for an absolutely fabulous uh, and thought-provoking presentation. I, the, the discussion around, I suppose, the factors in our sector that give rise to this always never fails to distress me and, and make me think. So thank you, Kate, for such a wonderful uh, NTU lecture and conclusion to our Blue Stocking Week. I'd now like to um, open the floor up to questions. So if you have questions for Kate or questions for the NTU, please use the raise hand function, which is located, it should be located down the bottom of your screen in the reactions button. If you have an older version of Zoom, you might find it somewhere else. So I'd like to open it up now to the audience for questions. Let's see. Ah, uh, here we go, Kristen. Hi, thank you. Hi, thank you so much for, for this talk. Um, I wanted to ask, seeing as at the heart of all of this is that issue of hierarchical structures and power imbalance. Um, and it's something that I've seen a lot. I'm part of an organization that's actually trying to help women uh, in ancient world studies, specifically in my field. And it's it's just so endemic and difficult to, to, to deal with. Is that Do you have any advice on trying to mitigate that power imbalance, particularly for young students and young women um, in such a difficult position? Yes, the, I mean, the, I guess the starting point is that the people at the most senior levels of the organisation need to accept and show leadership and recognise that steps need to be taken to address and, and minimise the risks of that power imbalance. So if I start there, the leadership really was... Um, it, it is quite often, uh, we often talk about, you know, leaders showing that they're role modelling and, you know, taking leadership. Um, I mean, you would know sometimes it's not even that, it's leaders themselves are cause, the cause of this misconduct. They are engaging in sexual harassment. So it is no wonder that um, it is despairing. Um, a couple of things in terms of thinking about those risk factors. So there's been a lot of work done in the legal sector as well, which has some of the similar hierarchical and the power and the issue or the conversation that was um, caused by the High Court case has produced some really good work. So I, I maybe would suggest, suggest you look there. So in Victoria, Helen Zoki led a review. In South Australia, there was a review by the South Australian Equal Opportunity Commission. Both of those did recognise the power disparity and also the so that particularly the associate judge relationship and how difficult that was. A couple of the things that we recognise in respect at work is in terms of the support and reporting part of that domain, um, the reporting, historically, the view's been taken that you, if you report, you've got to put your name to it, you've got to give, you know, everyone's got to be investigated, we've got to have interviews. And the focus of complaints has been on misconduct and on getting the bad guy, really. And actually, a lot of senior leaders think, well, it's all good, except if someone comes in, there might be a bad one and we've got to get them and sack them and... And that approach has not only the fact that people don't complain, but that really is on the basis that there's only one person that's a problem. And the reality is sexual harassment is a systemic issue. So in terms of those two domains, what we did was we really recommended that support be disaggregated from complaints. So what we found is lots of people can't get the support that they need uh, unless they make a complaint, you go in, HR says, do you want to make a complaint? Then they say, here's some supports. So one of that was saying, offer supports and make it independent if you can and make sure they're specialist. And then in terms of the reporting, we did recommend that any complaints process move from being primarily focused on the evidence to um, 
pri- or one of the key focus being a victim centric approach. So if someone comes and they say, I'm fearful, I don't want you to do anything about it, then you don't do, you know, you take different actions and you, and it's completely able to do that. But in those reporting options, we're really strong or I really strongly encourage there being options for people to report anonymously. And the reason for that is the organisation can get trend data, can get information. The person usually does not want to be part of an investigation, but usually does want their workplace to be better. So there's some of the things. Uh, But I would say, again, looking at that risk assessment, you would look at what are the situations where the power differential is so difficult Uh, If they've only got one person that's supervising and there's no other person to speak to, you know, there are some structural things that you can think of. And one of the things about an industry approach is once you start going back to what you know really well, which is how, what are the drivers, you can start being a bit creative and thinking, how would you unpick them or how would you, you're never going to stop there being senior, you know, senior lecturers and PhD students or whatever it might be that that is inherent but actually having no power over just basic fundamental human rights is not an inherent part of being working in the university Mm -hmm. sector. Fantastic thanks Kate I hope you don't mind me taking the liberty to add something there and I would say this I would encourage everybody to ask their workmates to join the union. Our NTU survey shows that people don't trust management when it comes to policing policies around sexual harassment, but they do trust the union. We have thousands of young casuals out there who aren't union members, and we are always stronger when we stand together. So if you do want to think about that power imbalance and how you rectify that, asking your union, your workmates to join the union is perhaps the most powerful, one of the most powerful steps you can take. Sorry for interrupting there. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good my, my two cents. Okay, next I have Tony and then Beck. Hi, thanks for that. Hi, Kate, thank you so much for your talk and, and your ongoing work. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, have you... Can you give us any examples of clever approaches to reaching um, casuals? Um, uh, that's that's the really that's a tricky thing. I mean, the, the issues are huge. Simple awareness of rights, uh, workplace rights in general. Never mind sexual harassment or OHS specific. Um, have you seen examples of, um, of good good strategies for reaching these workers um, in a way that might make a difference? It's a it's an absolutely great question. So a couple of our recommendations, because and and I 100% support that what Alison just said about in terms of the power disparity and how the collective, whether it's the union or a collective, is a really important way to uh, be able to you know make sure that the systemic nature of the problem is really identified we did make my observation in that um the focus groups that i mentioned to you was that the young people including people at universities who were often casual workers and i've got a 15 year old casual worker in my house as well and he's on his second job and you know fortunately i don't mention it to him but he does you know, I'm really conscious that he knows it's very important you get on well with the person who does the roster. I've I've begun to sort of see in real time how that small thing, how quickly you work out that you don't cross the person who does the roster if you want work. Um, so we did observe that young people tended to not particularly if they weren't in their full-time work or hadn't joined the industry of their life, um, hadn't joined a union. And I was really quite, um, I, I'd say shocked by how little educated they were on their workplace rights more broadly. So we did make some recommendations, but I'd love to tell you, I'll I'll tell you what I think we need to do when we're studying. We made some recommendations about schools teaching workplace rights. So like recognising that, you know, we, uh, you know, kids are starting work at 15 as here, um, that they need to know some of the fundamentals because they're also the most vulnerable at that age to some degree. Um, So we did make that recommendations. I do think some of the unions, I know the SDA has been really active in thinking about how to educate and reach those, uh, those 
sort of casual workers. I know some unions, for example, in the farming area, um, have really looked at migrant workers who are often casual and how to reach that. In terms of unions, I think there's some real thought being given to how to reach those people. I guess my argument would be government should or whoever should be doing broader campaigns because people aren't necessarily in unions. To the extent that unions do really great education campaigns that get into everyone's ears or, um, you know, the, even when you go into a shop and you see something, it is reaching more than your members and that is super important. So I wish I could give you the perfect example, but I think that um, reaching those people and even just the current conversation has been really important to improve our education. Oh, thanks, Kate. Yeah, I like the I like in particular the suggestion about getting into schools. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Kate. Rebecca, Rick. Hey, um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, cool. Sorry, I'm just in my car in between appointments, and I was, I've been listening um, since you started, and it's a, like some really shocking stats, but unfortunately, kind of not surprising. So shocking, but not surprising, if that makes sense. Um, I. I guess my question is kind of a philosophical one about the, you, you talked a bit about how it's more prevalent in more hierarchical structures. So I'm wondering what you think is the difference between um, people when employed in more flatter structures or working in flatter structures, why, I, I'm sure there, there are some obvious answers to that, but I'm, I'm also wondering, I guess, the, the second part of the question is how do we uh, start moving toward those more democratically run or more flat structures in um, in institutions or in workplaces? What are some of the ways that you think we could start working toward them? Yeah, I love that you're in a car. <laughs> it's good on you. Um, yes, so I'll, I'll just say, so one of the things that happens is people often talk about the characteristics of the victim of sexual harassment and that example of hierarchical and I just use that because it does apply to the university sector so our report does pick out we noticed in the stats there are a number of industries that have some traits uh, that and that hierarchical structure was one of them but I'll just tell you some of the others we identified one is again we come back to that retail and hospitality industries that have a very front-facing customer sort of um, role had high rates, the social assistance and healthcare where you're dealing with um, patients and face-to-face. -face. We identified very male-dominated sectors like mining and, sec and construction, uh, so where there was gender um, imbalance, uh, where there was high rates for men and women, but particularly for women. So there are a number of different um, industry traits. So I guess my first point is hierarchical isn't the only one. Having said that, our finding was the key, uh, the key driver was power disparity. And so what, in essence, what you are trying to look at is in many places, um, there are power disparity is inevitable. Hierarchical, you know, hierarchies are inevitable. Uh, but there is a lack of accountability. There are lack of avenues for independent supports. So my argument would be in terms of sexual harassment, uh, recognising that in some cases, some people should have the decision-making role over others, but in relation to fundamental workplace rights and human rights, they should not be able to sort of run their own race, that there are some legislative minimums that are expected and that, uh, that people should be held accountable and by, um, by misuse of power. So I'm not against power, I'm against abuse and misuse of power. Mm -hmm. And so there, whether you can remove the hierarchy or at least, at least put in some better protections. And one of, the, um, one of the good protections is to get better gender balance in the most senior roles. Mm. So we definitely found that organisations that have, and there's some good research out of the US actually, that if you have gender balance leaders or women are more likely to respond positively, as in if someone brings forward a complaint, they don't say, oh, that's terrible, it happened. They're more likely to say, yes, we'll investigate it. 
a male manager is more likely to say, are you sure? Did you misunderstand? What were you wearing? What were you doing? Did you lead them on? So we need to get to that point where, you know, the, the, and, and it doesn't mean that men can't have a better response, but the research is particularly where there's male-dominated leadership. Um, people don't have confidence in the complaint avenues and, and the evidence would suggest that's for a good reason. Thanks, Kate. Next, I've got Alexander. G'day. Um, I wanted to ask about soft power and um, things like a uh, supervisor, for example, you know, if a complaint is made uh, as a response or, or like a revenge to that, you know, being moved to certain days if you're a casual or being moved to a different department or eventually being, you know, people trying to kind of manage you out of existence in terms of your employment. So I, I wanted to ask if there's any advice you would give um, to situations where uh, a supervisor or a superior, you know, in kind of revenge for being uh, blamed or, or, or alleged to have done a sexual assault or, or harassment, uh, for that to have happened, what advice would you give where soft power is being used. I hope that question kind of made yes. sense. You might have to pick it up and tie it together, but but yeah. It makes total sense. That question is a really good question because when I talk about leadership, uh, we do talk about, you know, the high sort of CEO leadership, but the reality is the leadership that we need is at that line level. So it is at that supervisor or the next line up. So I might go the positive way before I'll go to the sort of the implications of what you've talked about. So when we did the National Inquiry, I did quite frequently, including to those young people ask, you know, could they describe to me when they'd been in a workplace where they felt safe and what were the characteristics or traits that were present there? And I often have jokingly said, no one ever said we had a really well-written policy, even though every time a complaint comes in, most organisations go and rewrite their policy, right? No one said the policy just was just so well written. They almost always said, I have a line manager who I trust, who role models appropriate behaviour, who has spoken to me about this and who has assured me if I have any concerns that I can come to him or her. Um, and, and it was men and women were the line managers. So it was really clear to me that when I start on leadership, it is um, managers who create a psychologically safe workplace uh, where issues can be brought forward. Now, what um, you're describing is uh, potentially someone who is or has been accused of sexual harassment. So maybe they didn't, maybe they feel it was a bit unfair. Um, it's a really good example. If you're casual, then actually, if I go to my son, who'd be quite surprised he was being talked about right now, but, you know, that roster manager is the person. He, it, from his point of view, yes, he'll get paid, but... So to make a complaint about that person just just would, you know, you may as well leave the job altogether was, is, would be the impression I'm getting from him. Um, first to know is that it is unlawful victimisation to do that, to issue a detriment because someone has made a complaint of sexual harassment, whether it's well-founded or not. Uh, that, however, this conversation, though, is what one of the National Inquiry uh, findings is that no one makes complaints, but if they do, they do suffer a detriment. It does happen that they're being victimised. And even when I was a practising lawyer, I used to deal with organisations who said, yeah, but we just can't guarantee people won't suffer if they make a complaint. Like that's, you know, it was like I was talking crazy stuff to suggest that their job was to make sure this per people didn't suffer. So a couple of things. One is that I quite often, again, multiple reporting avenues, but also, you know, in some sense, you really, um, it's a very difficult scenario. So you really, and the union can be really good at this. You need to go in and start questioning at the top in broad questions. What what is this organisation doing positively on this? 
And that would be a really good example of one of the things that could easily happen in casual work. So that it is a real, it is a real concern. At respect to work, it really highlighted um, that issue of the different ways people work now. So in 1984, when the Sex Discrimination Act was started, you know, people had a job and it was ongoing. It was with the one employer. When we did respect at work, the definition of workplace and employment just really didn't work anymore because people don't work like that. So some of the um, legislative amendments that were passed on the 11th of September are about aligning the description of workplace to make sure that you're covered to make it match the way the safety laws work as well. So I haven't given you the perfect answer because it's a really great example of in its absolute power. You know, you describe it as soft power. It's sort of the um, insidious, uh, but it's absolutely, we heard the opposite. If you have the opposite, if you have a good line manager, then it's it's the pathway to a really good workplace. Thanks so much. We're almost out of time. I'll just go to Terry briefly. Kristen, I can see you've got your hand up again. If we run out of time, maybe flick us an email separately. And if you need some help in a particular situation, get in contact. Terry, I think you might have something to say about this too. Uh, yeah, very. First of all, thank you very much, Kate. Um, and thank you for all the kind words about um, the NTU's contribution to uh, the discussions around sexual harassment. Um, uh, it's very interesting what you say about um, nobody ever says we had a great policy. Universities themselves, so they have fantastic policies. Um, they have a plethora of policies, but as we know, um, these there is it doesn't necessarily reflect what happens on the ground, and a lot of staff are very um, worried about coming forward and speaking, especially in terms of impact on their careers, because often the harasser might even be somebody who potentially um, could have a real impact on their future careers, especially if they're a postgraduate student. Um, on that, though, there was one interesting thing that I wouldn't mind getting your feedback on, and that is, um, and it's unique to higher education, is the use of student evaluation surveys. And these are often used by universities to um, performance manage staff. But unfortunately, we've discovered that um, student evaluation surveys can often be a source of um, harassment yeah. um, for, for staff members in particular. Um, they, can use, they can end up with um, staff being targeted. Um, you know, we find that there's been a, a bias in terms of gender, um, star, staff which may have um, a disability or a different cultural background may often also be targeted um, in these for bullying. But sexual harassment is a real issue um, in these things. And it kind of leads us to the, the question about you know, the use of, of these um, tools for performance management by universities, which are very corporatized, um, and the impact on, on staff. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts uh, around that and how the union, um, we have been opposing this for a while, but how the union could perhaps um, move this forward. Um, I completely agree and I know and I'm sure some of your members provided submissions to our inquiry on this very point that there were some really pretty horrific examples of student harassment of teachers and so when um, when I also talk about power I do acknowledge that power can run in multiple directions and uh, and that is a good example uh, and the the power and also the sort of lack of gender equality and lack of intersectional sort of equality in that experience is a concern. Um, uh, I would strongly encourage, I'm happy if you want to talk to me as well, um, uh, to, to really be advocating for to the universities, which you've already been doing, uh, but of the serious risk of both harassment, discrimination and real um, harm caused by misuse of those survey tools. I think that like any workplace, I mean, upward feedback is a thing and we all get it, um, but it is a little different when you've got students who are not the same as co-workers providing that feedback. 
so I just think it, it reminds me a bit, it's not the same, but of the banks realizing that harassment and abuse was being caused by people doing one cent transactions and putting abusive comments is uh, there should be some rigor around looking about how those survey tools are being used, whether they are being misused. And I'm sure smart people, smarter than me, but who work in the university sector could identify ways to ensure that that, that sort of feedback um, is sort of somehow intersected so it doesn't cause harm to people's careers and, and themselves. Fantastic. Thank you, Kate. That brings us to the end of Blue Stocking Week and our NTU lecture. Uh, before we conclude, I'd just like once again you all to join me in really thanking Kate Jenkins for a fascinating and thought-provoking and somewhat disturbing uh, lecture. Thanks once again. Um, 2020 and 2021 have been a particularly difficult year for our sector. We've watched 35,000 job losses across our public universities and 61% of those job losses have been borne by women. This has been a week where we reflect about on what's happened to our sector and the issues that continue to front, confront everybody, but in particular women across our sector. As I said earlier, Although this picture is a bit bleak, we are always stronger when we come together and we support one another. The NTU is as strong as its members and you're an awesome bunch, but we'll be even stronger if you talk to your workmates, your colleagues, your friends about joining. If we stand together, we can shape higher education to be a sector free from discrimination and issues like sexual harassment. Happy Blue Stocking Week, everyone. Have a fantastic weekend and thanks so much for coming and Kristen will be in contact. Thanks, everyone.